Welcome to this week in Missouri politics from Kansas City. The legislative session's off, and so is the election year. And we're joined by Representative Greg Razor from here in Kansas City, running for state senate. First of all, Representative, tell folks a little bit about yourself. You've been on the show before, but give folks a little bit of your background as you're running for the state senate. Yeah, so I've lived here in Kansas City for 18 years. This is home now. Uh, but of course, my childhood home is Cooter, Missouri, down in Pemiscott County. Down the boot hill where they down. produce political talent by the bundles, there, right? There you go, there <laughs> you go. So it's the most southeastern town in the state. I grew yep. up on a cotton farm, uh, got a scholarship and ended up at the University of Missouri, uh, where maybe my claim to fame is I was Truman the Tiger. I, yep. And I, then I, after I college, found myself here in Kansas City, fell in love with the city, and now this is home. It is a terrific place, and you and you really your is. current house district represents a really a really great part of it. I think when you start associating Kansas City to me, your district, the Plaza, Arrowhead, those are places that you really you first think about. You know, they're really iconic, and yeah. and you know one of the things that drew me to Kansas City uh, were really the people. Uh, it's a very welcoming town. It, it mm -hmm. feels like a West Coast type city. If you got a smile on your face, yep. and a funny story, come sit by us, and you know. Make Kansas City. It's home. a little bit like the Boot Hill, right? It There's is a little bit yeah. natural transition. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so folks, you could run for the House again, correct? I could. But you chose to run for state senate in what would be Senator Holzman's district, right? Exactly. So I'm finishing up. This will be the end of my second term, uh, but Senator Holzman was termed out, and so I decided to take that leap. Uh, as a minority member in the House, it can be rather frustrating uh, for those of us who want to go down and actually try to accomplish something, uh, and I feel like I can have a better shot of doing that in the Senate uh, representing the city of Kansas City and the best interests of the entire state. So about a couple of things I know you've, you've discussed here on our show, transportation. Absolutely. That's an issue that matters to you when you drive from Cooter to Kansas City, as you have, I'm sure. You really get the very good view of the state's roads. You get a great view of the state roads. And you know, I had an interesting conversation. I was back in Cooter for the holidays and uh, talking to a friend and she said, Greg, you gotta do something about these roads. And I said, I, you know, Carol, I'm trying. I'm trying my best. And she said, yeah, this gravel road is no good anymore. We need to pave them. And something hit me. I was like, she doesn't understand that, yeah. that that's not a state responsibility, but that the people she's voting for are the people that might want to turn the lettered yeah. route into a gravel road. Uh, might have to. Might. We're going to try to stop that from yeah. happening. Uh, you know, Democrats got Missourians out of the mud. We're going to try to keep them out of the mud. Harry Truman brought Jackson County out of the mud. That's right? right. That's right. So it is interesting. I, I hear there's a there's a you're a Democratic member of the legislature, but there's a Republican three step. When Republicans don't know how to solve a problem, they'll say, well, waste, fraud and abuse. Well, in MoDOT, look, MoDOT, you could always, no matter this television station, the Missouri Times, MoDOT could be run more efficiently. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure government, you're going to have a little less efficiency than the private sector as a general rule. But MoDOT is not a bloated system that wastes money. <laughs> I mean, they've done a lot of work. Patrick McKinnon's done a very good job. It seems like they should have earned the trust of policymakers at this point. You would think so. I mean, if you look back just, what, maybe five or six years ago, they uh, changed how they redistrict. Uh, yeah. They laid off some 1,200 employees. They sold off hundreds of piece, pieces of equipment. Uh, they have really streamlined their operation. And for as bad as the roads are, I really think that the department itself and the men and women uh, from Patrick McKenna all the way down to the folks that are, are out there plowing snow when the snowstorms hit, they deserve a lot of appreciation from the people of Missouri. They've done a fantastic job with the limited resources that we're providing them. Let me ask you the question I've asked Mike Parson and, and Mike Kehoe and, and Gina Walsh. Is it a credible public policy position to say we have to improve the state's roads and not bring in significant new revenue to MoDOT. They have to have the revenue. Yeah, nothing's I mean, free. I mean, nothing's free. We want good roads. Uh, if you have a, a kid in the boot hill going to school at Mizzou, you want to make sure that he or she has a safe road to drive on. If you're a business owner who wants to get your goods from point A to point B, you need a, a fast way to get them there. Uh, this is something that Missourians should all be able to come together on. And we need to go out and proactively educate Missourians about where we are as a state, where our infrastructure is as a state, make sure people understand that MoDOT is still working on a 1996 income uh, and that they can't keep up. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something, if you look at the state of Missouri, not just where we're located in the United States, but where we're located in North America, we should be a transportation hub. I mean, here we have the, the continent's two great rivers running through our state. We have, uh, the second and third largest rail hubs. We have two international airports sure. and interstates that go from coast to coast, Canada to Mexico. Why aren't we taking advantage of that? Uh, it's an opportunity that we're losing uh, each and every day. It would almost be like Florida not keeping track of its beaches. Absolutely. Let me ask you about something you've been very outspoken on, and that's Mona. You have yes. been a very uh, forceful advocate for that. 
break down for folks that maybe follow public policy but not close enough what MONA is and where it sits now in the so, legislative process? Yeah, MONA is the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act. It has been introduced now for 22 consecutive sessions. And we have uh, in state law now our human rights statute, which protects people in housing, mm -hmm. employment, and public accommodations. And it's for all the reasons that you would typically think of, race, religion, sex, disability, et cetera. This would add sexual orientation and gender identity. It's simply saying you can't fire someone just because they're gay. You can't kick a lesbian couple out of an apartment just because you find out they're a lesbian couple. Let me ask you a question. And I, and I, I think that, you know, to me, I, it might be the ignorance of not seeing what's in, in plain sight. I, I, I have eyes I'm, as a heterosexual, white, Christian male from the boot hill. I, I think I don't see these things jump out to me. I think that I think most Missourians, they don't want to mistreat people who have a different sexual orientation than they do. However, I think some of them don't see this as really happening. Let me just ask you the question. Do, do, do these things you just said, being kicked out of your apartment because you're a lesbian, being fired because you do those happen in the state of Missouri right now? Yes, they do. And I'm going to agree with you that most Missourians don't want to see that. Happen. But I think they don't also see the discrimination. They also don't see the discrimination. But let me ask you, if yeah. you're if you're a, a gay man in Poplar Bluff and you just lost your job, uh, first of all, there's no place to report it to because it's not illegal. Yeah, it's not illegal well, to be fired. St. Louis County ran into this. They used it as a defense. You could they, fire someone for being gay. And I was shocked. And legally, I'm not sure they're wrong. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it is happening. If you're in Poplar Bluff, you get fired from your job because your boss finds out you're well, gay. You're a cop in St. Louis County. Or you're a cop in St. Louis County. There is, uh, I know of a, a lesbian couple that had a hard time finding a place to live in Joplin. They'd pick up the phone and call and, and the person would say, yeah, come on by and look at it. And they would show up, obviously a couple, and they wouldn't get a call back. I, I think the, the St. Louis County incident really could be, you know, a lot of times I've watched public policy issues that get put off. It's that one news story that changes it. Republicans will fall all over themselves. They're their pro cop, right? Yep. Just ask them. You better have some time on your hands because they're going to tell you. But now what if you're a gay cop? Does it matter? Where, should it matter? Of course not. But but maybe it does. I think the one thing is there wasn't this instance where yes, this happens in Missouri. This happens right here. This is a high profile situation with a with a with a police officer that Republicans say they have the back of. I think this could be the one thing that, that really changes the debate to now you're telling you're not just telling some hypothetical person. You're telling this officer that you should be able to be fired for being gay. It, it to me, it, if you if you've been an opponent of this, it gives you a very challenging time to maintain your opposition. I agree, and I think uh, in a decision that came out just last year, the Chief Justice even said that, that it's the legislature's inaction on this particular bill that says that we want discrimination to continue. Uh, he, he wrote that in a dissenting opinion. Uh, I, I think it's very powerful, and we see it playing out right there in St. Louis County. Let me ask you a couple more things before you go. Yeah. As, uh, as you get to the next legislative session, how do Democrats make a difference from the House? You know, we have to... First of all, get our message out. We gotta get our message out through the media. We gotta let Missourians know that there is a better option uh, than continuing to let our roads deteriorate, than continuing to uh, not fund higher education at adequate levels so that we're putting all the burden of paying for that on the shoulders of working families who are trying to send their kids to school. Uh, we've got to stand up for our communities, whether they're in the inner city or rural communities, to make sure that people have the health care that they deserve mm -hmm. and that hospitals stay open. Uh, right there in our hometown neck of the woods, the, yep. the hospital in Kennett has closed. If you have a stroke in Kennett, Missouri, and minutes matter, you have to drive to Poplar Bluff, you have to drive to Hayti, to Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, that, that's a life-changing thing when that hospital closes. Let me ask you a question. You, you're going to go now from a representative who, like you said, a lot of it's messaging. You're going to have to talk about things that are passing and why they're bad. You're going to be affecting every piece of legislation that comes to the legislature as a state senator. It's interesting. It, on the one hand, the, the state of Missouri will probably reelect a supermajority of Republican yes. state senators. You have your own principles. You can choose to stand and filibuster on anything and hold the whole process up by yourself. How do you take that responsibility and how will you shuffle it? Uh, changing it, going, walking across that rotunda? You know, I, th I, I think of that question and think of two answers. One is, you know, when I walk into the room, a lot of people may see me as the, the big city liberal gay guy, and they, there's a stereotype sure. to that. I think what a lot of my colleagues have learned is that I'm a rather sensible person mm -hmm. uh, and want to find solutions uh, to issues. I know that I'm not going to get big pieces of legislation passed, but I am willing to work with anyone 
uh, to try to make something a little bit better. Yeah. So that's part one. Part two is, as senator, you do have power of the filibuster, uh, but you have to use that sparingly. Uh, you can't go out and do that every day. So you have to look at the issues that you care about the most. Uh, obviously, to me, one will be uh, I, I can't stand for any anti-LGBT legislation mm -hmm. to go uh, forward. Uh, I, can, I can guarantee you, uh, and I lived through this myself, sure. that in today, as we sit here, in every single House district, in every single Senate district in this state, there is a teenager who is considering ending their life because they're LGBT and they're afraid to admit it. Uh, I have to stand up for those kids. I have to stand up and make sure that bad laws don't get put in place, that they don't see on the news, uh, that the, the state legislature has confirmed that they're a bad person. Well, as the session unfolds and as you work on making that walk across the tundra, I hope you'll come back here and talk about it on this week at Minnesota Anytime. Politics. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. We'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel, Kansas City's own Jeremy LaFavor. But first, this week, this week in Missouri Politics, midweek update at 11 o'clock. Go to our social media streams. Might even break out the Stein knowledge. We'll be right back after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state, helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. Moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's energy at work. Cameron, Missouri. Welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics from Kansas City. We are joined by former state representative Kevin Corley. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you, Scott. Great to be here. Okay, Hofflander, the uh, chair of the Missouri Republican Party, Correct. president. I never can remember chair. which one. I understand. Jamie LeFavor, former representative uh, from South Kansas City, friend of the show back. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Always great to be here with you, Scott. Let's start right off the top, Kevin. You're the attorney here. Let's talk a little clean Missouri. It is, is going to be the flashpoint on the internet. You can just see the you can see that the blue checkmark brigades all in. The Republicans think clean Missouri was a little bit of a bait and switch. The ethics th stuff, I don't think any Republicans really care about. They was fine with it, whatever. However, the redistricting part, I think most folks say it was a pig and a poke. Folks at least didn't really know it was in there and voted for it. Republicans want to pair that off and put it back on the ballot, right? Well, I, I think when you look at clean Missouri, it was sold as to fix gerrymandering. And you use that word, you see that word a lot. And uh, what people who supported Clean Missouri failed to tell, tell people was that the system that, we're, that we were trying to fix, the legislative redistricting, was done by a bipartisan commission. And if they didn't come to a decision, then unelected uh, judges who were, who were neutral in, in politics uh, would decide that issue. And so uh, in, in when it was, and it was funded by, by large uh, funding, meant much uh, dark money and such. And so I, I don't know if people really got a sense of what it would do. We will see what it will do. But in, when you try to draw districts that are 50-50 are Republicans and Democrats in a state like, like Missouri, you're going to end up with districts that go from inner city of Kansas City uh, strung out to, to Sedalia or something to try to get that mix. Although well intended, um, you know, that it, it doesn't seem like geographically it can work. Jeremy LeFevre, let me be honest here. You know, you might say if you read Twitter, I might have a bit of a weight problem. My mom might tell you I'm big boned. Isn't gerrymandering just who's in the eye of the beholder? Um, to some extent. It, 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 gerrymandering is a thing. Republicans and Democrats have all done it. Of course. Getting the, the most fair way possible, I think, makes sense. Now, 
whether clean Missouri needs to be completely undone in this regard, you know, I'm not 100% convinced that it does. I think there are merits on, on one side, but like most issues, the hyperbole on both sides tends to uh, take over the airwaves on this one. Okay, although you've been involved in Republican politics a long time. Okay. If the Republicans could gerrymander districts, they would. And if they could, they did. If Democrats could gerrymander districts, they would, and they did. And sometimes they may have went a little out of the bounds, both parties, but for the most part, I thought of the Commission of Judges, the, the, the problem with why there's more people that vote Democrat than is elected in the House is probably because the Democrats are densely populated in cities right on the state lines, more so than there's some sneaky district drawing. Yes, you know, the, the thing that we've ended up with is the realization that no one is going to be represented well with clean Missouri the way it stands now. We, we just aren't. It doesn't matter where you live. Uh, and so you have to look at it as, um, I think what it really is, is, is um, we've tried to take uh, two things and put them together. Mm -hmm. We well know that. The, the unfortunate thing is when we added uh, redistricting to the ethics, part of clean Missouri, that uh, we, we lost that in the whole picture. And I, th I think a lot of people didn't even know what they were voting on with clean Missouri. Uh, they may have understood the ethics part, and I think Missourians, especially this legislative session, are going to go further with the ethics part of mm. clean Missouri. They're going to go further and do more to make that better. I mean, I, I, I don't blame, the, yeah, I don't I blame so. the proponents for coming with an ex And you can't blame proposal. Sean Nicholson. He just doesn't like, get enough credit. Just it like I'm not going to blame the Republican Party for coming with something that's going to be benefit them. Sure. But let's not all pretend that this isn't about one system benefiting Democrats oh. more or I a, totally the new you. clean Missouri is going to benefit Republicans more. I, th I think it's let's going at to look at, at I know what you were talking about with the... Um, the panel and sure. and how that worked, but but honestly, I think where we are right now with the situation we're in right now, you're going to see Republicans go much further with ethics interesting reform, and they're going to also take the redistricting part out of the I have to say out of the partisan hands of. Auditor Galloway. Let's talk about, you're an attorney, and this is interesting to me. You've ran in these districts. You, want, you ran in the competitive districts, which is a rarity. Very few, very few members of the House can say I was in a competitive general election. I, I do wonder, is, it, is, is the law written where you can put things on the ballot, is it written too broadly to where you can conflate two things that really probably are separate questions together? I mean, it's a brilliant move by the people that did Clean Missouri. They don't get enough credit for it. But is it, is it maybe the, the real problem? You should make it a little more strict on what you can put on the ballot. I, I think that's true, uh, Scott. And uh, in, in a district like mine, it would have been helpful uh, yeah. know, in, to, as a Republican to serve in a Democrat majority district. But uh, you, can't, you can't take an isolated district and say, you know, we're going to apply this to the rest of the state. Um, and when you put something on the ballot, what the voters see is you know, w one paragraph usually. Mm -hmm. and, sure. mm -hmm. But what's behind that is, you know, 10 or 11 pages of of uh, legislation and rules and regulations that people don't see and it becomes that that does become a problem and so there do need to be better rules about what can be put on the ballot in particular when it comes to constitutional amendments uh, when we put a constitution on the federal government uh, in very challenging it's it's very challenging three quarters of the state need to to ratify that give me a prediction do, does something reach the ballot that addresses clean missouri's redistricting portion i do believe so yes it it? absolutely um Republicans are going to take it to the people again, and I think it's the right thing to do. Does it make it? Uh, I think it's too much of a priority of the Republican Party I agree that. not to make it. I think it would be interesting to make the argument that voters didn't know what they were doing last time, dicey, but they're going to know what they're going to do this time. Okay. So I think once the Republican Party figures out those talking points, I think they'll be in better shape. Explain something to someone sitting in my office right now, sitting on a couch that I think I got from Wayfair. There's a Wayfair law right now, and this is fundamentally unfair. If you buy something online, you don't pay sales tax on it. If you buy it 
at a store, a brick and mortar store that sponsors T-ball teams, a member of the chamber you do. That's right. You're working on a piece of legislation that would address that, right? That's right. Uh, right now, there are some online, large online retailers that do voluntarily collect that uh, sales tax, but sales tax is a tax that is already owed. It's, it's not something, uh, this wouldn't be a new tax, this would simply be a new yeah. collection mechanism so that uh, large online retailers collect it, could collect it. There is some difficulty in that, particularly from the state of Missouri. We have more individual sales taxing districts than any other country in the state. And part of the Wayfair decision said our solution to it or any state solution to it has to be simple. And our system of col collection, is not, collection is not simple yet. And so there's gotta be some, some fixes to that. But the state right now is missing out on hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue that is already owed. Taxpayers owe this already. It's just not very many voluntarily paid. Jeff Bezos wasn't your constituent, but you did have plenty of brick and mortar store businessmen that were. Wh whatever you do with it, it does seem fundamentally unfair to have Jeff Bezos skate by without paying his share of Missouri tax, but then make Slug Hefner from Poplar Bluff pay his. Right, and I think that that's where you see recognition among elected officials, amongst mayors, amongst county commissioners. Yeah. Things that, that, that their local businesses, um, you know, don't, don't do business in the same manner as, as an online sale. So there is a sense that there needs to be parity, and I think the legislature will de deal with that. Um, the, the issues will be the mechanism that, that, that is done and what all, what all ends up in the bill. But I think there's a recognition of, of fairness to everybody in that. So, Jeremy, we've talked about getting things on the ballot, and we've mm -hmm. talked about how you collect the money. Now let's talk about Medicaid expansion. It's going on the ballot, <laughs> That's right. and it's going to require some money from somewhere. Uh, to me, these things tie together. I, I guess, I mean, I think people should just plan on it happening, because if you don't run a campaign against it, which I'm not seeing anybody step up to really fund a campaign uh, opposing it, it looks like it passes. I think it does, and I, I also think that the a lot of the costs that certainly members of the legislature sometimes assign to it are overblown. Um, many of the people that the state totally pays for, if we expanded Medicaid, the federal government would take over the payments of that. Um, and so the impact, at least to the state budget, I think is less than what uh, at least the budget leaders now think it is. There will be some initial investment, but over time, this will be a cost savings to the state of Missouri, while also providing a, a whole lot of health care for folks, which is good for the state. We saw a report this week that showed that Missouri's GDP over the last 10 years is lower than any other region. We're closing down hospitals across the state where healthcare is a big driver of that. Not only do we have an opportunity to grow our GDP like our neighbors are doing, but we've got an opportunity to, to provide healthcare for folks, and that's important. Let me ask you, I mean, it, it, when you really break some of these issues down, I mean, it, it looks like Repul Democrats are doing what Republicans do in states like California. They're going to the ballot to pass things. Medicaid expansion, there's, there's, there is support for expanding Medicaid. In the state. Whether it's enough, I guess we'll see. But I remember Todd Graves from here in Kansas City telling me if they don't do something on Cleveland, Missouri, it's going to pass. He sounded that alarm. There was really not a, a seriously funded opposition to it. It passed. Now it's been talked about ever since the day it passed. Is Medicaid expansion be the next thing where the other side doesn't really make a case to the voters and it goes through? It, it could be, and that's when you take something to the ballot, the talking points are what, what sells the day. Sure. And unfortunately, you can't work through those issues like you can in a legislature. See, the legislature, they are tasked with another constitutional amendment, a balanced budget amendment that says that they can't spend more than is brought in. So they're faced with the issues if Medicaid uh, expansion does expand the budget, um, and there's there's a variety of, of studies that go either way on that. But if it does, they'll be tasked with having to cut other issues, uh, cut other needs. And so that's the kind of debate that really needs to take place. Although the federal government is to pick up 90 percent of of the increased en enrollment at this point, there's still uncertainty with the with the yeah. Affordable Care Act, with Obamacare. The a court just struck down a portion of it just a few months ago. So there's still ongoing uh, litigation. Just a, f a couple years ago, it was one vote short of being uh, struck down in Congress. And we all know with elections, cycles change. Two years from now could be different. So those are the kind of debates that we need to have. Um, well, while there may be some good things that come out of it, let's make sure it's done right, funded properly, and that the state can provide for the needs of its citizen in a responsible manner. Okay, I'm is I'm this, just gonna are jump you going to be on the campaign trail here? I'm going to jump in on this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to push back on some sure. of this. Medicare expansion 
takes me back to all the time after time that Missourians have rejected Obamacare. Medicare expansion is the same thing as Obamacare. It really is free health care for able-bodied senior adults. And I don't think Missourians are going to support um, Obamacare too, if you want to call it that. And, and there's another thing. Um, so Medicare expansion, uh, it, it's, a, it's a term that we throw out there. It sounds good. It's the voter candy you were talking about just a minute ago. Who pays the bill, right? It, it, yeah. And, and it sounds good. But in the end, who's going to pay for it? And you're talking about some of that. The, um, the Missouri budget is a pie, right? And well, two big pieces of it are education and social services. And everything else that we do as government is a slice of that pie. Yeah. So who's going to pay for this? How are we going to do well, this? Well, let me ask you this question. I think this education? may be the key point is who's going to pay for a campaign opposing it? Is yeah. there going to be someone? That's it. And if it's clearly explained, I think voters in Missouri who have voted time and time again against Obamacare are not going to vote for this. I think it would be a no vote if it's clearly explained and if there's some someone that you said, like as you said, that would take it and run with it. During the favor, we need to be clearly explained who won the week. Uh, this week, uh, we're here in Kansas City, and yes. the big winner, I think, in Kansas City, but also nationally, is our new mayor, Mayor Quentin Lucas, who filed a lawsuit against an illegal uh, or a national gun manufacturer and who was trafficking illegal guns uh, on Kansas City. The mayor has made uh, violent crime and reducing violent crime a top priority. He has went about it in a way that helps enforce laws that already exist, and so that's a huge win for him locally and nationally. Who won the week? Oh, who won the week? Mike Parson. <laughs> did you see the quarterly reports? I'm sure Absolutely. you did. Came in the last quarter over half a million dollars in the last quarter, and that with an independent PAC that supports him is now $6.5 million in cash on hand. When we say who's going to pay for it, maybe Mike Parson, right? Yeah. Kevin, who won the week? <laughs> well, I think on a national level, probably President Trump in probably. handling with yeah. Iran. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, mm -hmm. he, he really showed that when, when a, a, the largest state sponsor of terror in the world uh, continually attacks and goes against Americans, that he'll be willing to fight he, he back. came off looking good. And, and yeah. did so in a measured response yeah. such that, that the, the situation is de-escalating. But I, th I think... I'd President Trump, Parson, Quentin Lucas, I'm going to say Ann Wagner, speaking of President Trump, she had her, uh, a bill to fund getting some rape kits tested. They actually signed by the president this week. I think it's a win the state level and the federal level. We'll be back next week from St. Louis on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank.